have just pressed the let's go live button. And so we got to wait for those tubes to connect themselves all across the fruited plane of the interwebs before we go ahead and get started on this amazing Wednesday. We don't have trial in session, but we do have trial business to attend to. And it looks like things are connecting right along. Amazing on YouTube, on Rumble, on Locals, and on Telegram, and on X. That's tremendous. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney. And today, we're talking about New York and how Donald Trump and the campaign for 2024 are now going to be making a play for it to win, to emerge victoriously from the gutters of the decrepit justice system that we know exists there. And so we're going to talk about that and also talk about what happened yesterday and what we can be expecting moving forward in this Trump trial, because we are moving our way through jury selection a little bit more quickly than we thought. And Trump and his team are now saying, you know, there's a little bit of a, a problem with how this process has been going. In fact, they filed something before jury selection even started, but we're just getting the docket, you know, now because this stuff is not publicized. Thank you, Judge Murkan. But we have this objection saying we, you know, from the Trump team saying we object to the format of this. We'll go through that. Trump is also saying we thought maybe we got some more strikes here and we're starting to witness just how biased and partisan the New York jury is. In fact, we have one of the jurors who was not included. She was removed from the possibility of being a juror, excused. Her name is Kara McGee. And she was out giving interviews. In fact, several of them. And so we're going to listen to one of them in a, a bit. And our friend Viva also caught a good clip from her because she's making this point that, you know, she could be fair and impartial, but She's not that big of a fan of Trump. And you're going, what on earth? Who are these people? So we'll listen to that, see what she says about it. We're going to listen to this clip from George Conway. Do you notice something different about George Conway? Something feel different about him? Something a little familiar about how he looks? We'll see if we can dig into that. Because <laughs> there's been a pretty radical shift in the, the Conway uh, lifestyle. I'm not sure what's going on. But we'll see what he has to say. Judge Murkan, we know that he's issued a contempt order and we have a reply deadline, which has been set for this Friday. So Trump's team is going to be responding to the effort to fine him several thousand dollars and then threaten him with jail, order him to remove the posts, all the things related to contempt. And so we'll talk about that. And then we got a clip from this guy. Do you remember this guy? What's his name? K K K K Kevin. That's it. Kevin. He's out on with Fox. And he was talking about how the Democrats are just rigging everything before 2024. Obviously, that's the case. Kev's back in the House. So funny that he emerges when the House is in total disarray. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do some news interviews now. Hmm. How about that? We also had a new filing came out from this guy, Matthew Colangelo. OK, we keep talking about Alvin Bragg. He's just a placeholder, just kind of a empty vessel. This is the guy who's really doing all the work. Remember, Matthew Colangelo has worked for Obama. Then he went to work for Letitia. Then he went to work for Joe Biden. Then he went to work for Alvin Bragg. And every time he was there, guess who he was prosecuting? Oh, yeah, Donald Trump. So we'll refresh our recollection on that and then see what he submitted. Because if Trump decides that he's going to take the stand, well, they're going to impeach him. They're going to attack his credibility with these prior bad acts. And so we'll go through that filing, see what's inside before we get some reaction on this. Weissman, we got a clip of him. They're as giddy as can be about all this. They're saying, you know, first of all, gagging Trump was, you know, in our opinion, completely unconstitutional. We're in the middle of an election season. It's not only Trump's right to free speech to speak, his right to speak, but our right to receive. And so now when Trump came out during the first two days of jury selection, we know that he gave several statements to the media. And so they're very excited about this. They're saying, oh, yeah, let's use those statements against him. Right. Anything you say or do can and will be used against you in the court of law. And they're saying, perfect. He's making admissions every time he comes out and defends himself. So, right. Trump is gagged. Then he makes comments. They're saying we're going to use those comments against him. We're in the middle of an election season and it is insane what's happening. Even Bill Barr agrees. He criticizes this whole prosecution, calls it an abomination and criticizes 
the left on this and he's right and even a broken clock can be right as they say so we've got two good segments to get to today then we're going to jump in and hear from you we do not have trial in session today they're taking wednesdays off for whatever reason and then we're back tomorrow with jury selection but we did have uh, some analysis we're going to understand before the end of the day who is currently on the jury panel right who has currently been seated because we we're up to seven people who are now on the panel and we need to know who they are or about them so we'll talk about all of that and more we're glad that you are here and with us this morning we had an amazing membos only stream where we chat about what else is cooking around the world we talked about well a lot more about trump's bodega appearance yesterday which we got a little bit of a taste of that at the end of the show yesterday but we're in on that this morning talked about joe biden talked about some of his other uh, people like we saw Mayorkas kind of doing his rounds. We watched Josh Hawley beat the crap out of Jennifer Granholm from the Department of Energy. That was fun. So we do a lot of fun stuff. We have a great community. Watching the watchers.locals.com is where we'd love to see you join us. And we do after parties after the show. So make sure you come over there when the show's over. We have robertgovea.com where we put our PDFs and you have access to the mind map, our daily newsletters there, show reports, merch store, calendar. And by the way, show notes, we've got an update tomorrow for Membos one hour early and showtime one hour later. I've got an event both Thursday and Friday all day, a virtual event that I'm going to be attending to try to uh, learn and educate myself about things. So going to attend to that and then we'll just move our, our, our um, stream time just a little bit uh, further on the margin. So we'll see you then. But the calendar will be updated after the show. Also, WatcherLodge.com. We got some cool stuff cooking. We got some new dates I'm about to throw in the calendar. It's going to be fun over there. So WatcherLodge.com. We do Sovereignty Saturdays. Come check it out. WatcherLodge.com. Links in the description below. And we're checking in on our home garden. And we're checking in on our... Also was at the range over the weekend. You can see how your boys basically Keanu Reeves and John Wick now. <laughs> Don't even worry about it. I know. All right. So let's get to it because we've got some business to attend to. Donald Trump says, you know what? If we're gonna get lambasted in New York, how about we just win the entire state? Shows up at a bodega, not a bogida, as Dr. Jill Biden would like to say, and was there speaking with the crowd, speaking with the media, representing what he stands for in the campaign for 2024. Meanwhile, his political opponents are prosecuting him. and so. Trump and his team have objected to the format of how this jury process has been unfolding. We're going to read through that. We're also going to hear from Trump and see what his objection was, because he's recognizing, as we all are, that the jury pool in New York feels like it's a little bit anti-Trump, feels like it's a little bit biased. When you say, is there anybody in this panel of 90-something people who cannot be fair and over half the hands go up, that's a problem. Then when you get to the second stage of jury selection, people say, oh, no, I don't have an immediate problem. I can be fair and impartial. Then you get to the second stage and you find out that the person who's there, her husband posted the severed head of Trump. Remember that? And they're like, oh, well, I thought that was just comedy. You're like, uh, no, that, that means you're a psycho person. Oh, well, I guess maybe I am not fair and impartial then. Right. So then that person, I think, might even be on the jury. We'll find out. So that's the point. We've got a lot of people who are pretty bad about being a judge of their own capability to be fair and impartial, all just making their way through the process. And then they're going to tell us it's all fair and nonpartisan. But Trump made a visit to a bodega in New York. We're going to see what he had to say. He says, we're just going to win New York. We're going to learn who the jurors are. We're going to hear from one of the jurors who was excused from the panel before we zoom in and figure out what the heck is going on with George Conway. Sums up with him. And Kevin McCarthy was out here as well. So let's get right to it because Trump is saying, all right, now's the time. We're coming for New York, baby. Let's turn the state blue. This was after day two of the trial. Trump was out. Remember, he's anchored down. Murkan has said that he can't go anywhere, really. If he doesn't show up in court, warrant for your arrest. So Wednesday, he's kind of bogged down. Now, trials are technically not happening and unless the judge decides he's going to accelerate it or maybe they're behind schedule so he will hold a Wednesday hearing we'll see he'll call an audible I'm sure to make it as painful for Trump as possible whatever is going to be the biggest pain in the butt for him and 2024 he'll figure out how to do that so Trump says no problem we'll show up this street is teeming 
with criminality because Alvin Bragg is incompetent and the Biden administration has enabled criminality at the border, which is now translating to the cities and so on. So Trump shows up, he says, okay, let's talk about some real crime that's actually happening here with people who are trying to just make their livelihoods on the street in New York. Here's Trump standing up for the people. Oh, there's a America and give them hope to restore the American dream. Atlanta, New York, Philly, Chicago, DC. We're going to come in and number one, you have to stop crime and we're going to let the police do their job. They have to be given back their authority. They have to be able to do their job. And we're going to come into New York. We're making a big play for New York. Yeah, Other yeah. cities too, but this city, I love this city. And it's gone so bad in the last three years, four years. And Trump helped build that city. We're going to straighten New York out. So running for president, we're putting a big hit on New York. We think we can win New York. With a half a million migrants that poured in and take over the parks, they took over your hotels, they take over everything. It's no good. And you know what they've done? They've destroyed so many people. The African-American community now is not getting jobs. Migrants are taking their jobs that are here illegally. Hispanics are not getting jobs. Migrants are taking the jobs. If you look at the unemployment, the unemployment is good for migrants now. It went up 10% all migrants. And they're, they're in our country. Now, they're coming from prisons. I don't know if you know. They come know. from mental yeah, institutions. They come from prisons. They come from places you don't want to know about. They, they're coming from jails and prisons, mental institutions, and insane asylums. And you have massive numbers of terrorists coming into our country, all because of Biden. And by the way, this trial that I have now, that's a Biden trial. They want to keep me off the campaign trail, but based on what I'm doing, I think there's more press here than there is uh, if I went out to some nice location. And there's a lot more people there than there are for any Biden events, that's for sure. People, there's like seven people who show up. They're all media people, and we are Democrats who, you know, we don't want to talk about. So Trump visits the bodega. Now, he also, after that, right, he's trying to figure out how he's going to juggle all this simultaneously but he's pretty good at this stuff so i have total faith that he'll figure it out it'll probably maybe even amplify what they're trying to suppress right we call it the streisand effect on the interwebs they say you try to censor something you try to silence somebody or suppress some information about this and then boom everybody just pays attention to it because of the fact that you're trying to stop someone so they're trying to stop trump from leaving they know his mega rallies are very powerful, as they saw in the aftermath of 2016, when they realized that was a pretty important thing. They know COVID in 2020 was able to suppress that enthusiasm, suppress that energy. So how are they going to do that this time? Well, they just box them in in New York. But as we see, as more and more people, I think, generate energy around this, the trial's not even really underway yet. I mean, we are, we're in you know, day three tomorrow, but the trial will be in uh, once opening arguments start, we get witnesses coming in. Stormy Daniels is, you know, doing her skip there into the courtroom, whatever. It's going to be a lot more interesting and a lot more energy focused down on this area. And Trump will be able to capitalize upon that. So here is what the former president said when he was on True Social responding to the day of jury selection. He says, you know, I thought strikes were supposed to be unlimited when we're picking our jury. And I was then told we only had 10 of them which is not nearly enough when we were purposely given the second worst venue in the country. And you're asking yourself, what? Second? Don't worry, says Trump. We have the first worst also. As the witch hunt continues, election interference, which is just hysterical. I mean, Trump is hilarious. That is hilarious. We have the second worst venue in the whole country. Guess what? We also have the first two as well. Have a great week, election interference. See you tomorrow. You know, it's just like, oh my gosh, it's hysterical. And I think that agitates them so badly. The first worst, we all know where that is. It's Chutkin. It's January 6th case in Washington, D.C., first worst and the second. So they strategically timed them in two different locations. Now, I think what Trump is probably talking about are, you know, strikes for cause. It's like, hey, if this person comes out and is holding up a severed head of me, Maybe that person should be struck for cause, maybe. And, you know, versus uh, just, just, uh, just by discretion, right? You also have discretion to just use your peremptory strikes to just get rid of people. So 
the numbers, right? Trump is saying, well, a lot of these people should just be gone for cause. And why are they being here if they want my head on a silver platter, wackos? So, all right, that's Trump. Now he's responding to jury selection. We also have Trump and his team. They submitted a formal objection to Judge Murkan that we're going to hear about right after this quick message. And we have live stream privilege on this, so we just fast forward through those. And of course, but they're amazing, so check them out. But we also, now we jump back in to Trump's objection to jury selection. And here is what the defense team submitted to Judge Juan Murkan in the criminal case. Here, Honorable Judge Juan Murkan, they say, this is from Todd Blanche. This is their pre-motion letter that we know they have to get permission from the judge before they submit any official filings. And so this went in right before the jury selection started, but we know that this is a problem to get these filings because the court has declined to make the record public. We have to get this stuff sort of uh, secondhand, not from directly from the court docket itself. So this is an objection that's being lodged for the appeals, right? And we'll may come back to this when this thing comes back on appeals. But here is what Trump's defense team, Todd Blanche and others were arguing to Judge Murkan. They said, okay, here, Judge, we respectfully submit this pre-motion letter on behalf of President Trump concerning two issues relating to the court's letter regarding jury selection. Now, we request that this letter be treated as our full submission, right? So we're anchoring in our objections moving forward. They say, first, your proposal about the dismissal of potential jurors who self-identify as being unable to serve is inadequate because the plan, right? Remember the judge said, we're just going to allow a moment for jurors to say self-select themselves out. Anybody here can't be uh, biased or can't be fair for any reason? Yeah, me. Okay, great. Not even going to ask you a reason. You're gone. Now, if you do that, it's not going to create a sufficient record. And we need a good record for appellate review or a venue change motion, right? So we want to keep tabs on the numbers. Why can't people ultimately serve? Like, what's the basis for this? How can we chronicle this if you're just like waving people out of here? You're just saying, oh, good enough, whatever, see ya, you know, you're, you don't need to serve. So let's like create a spreadsheet on this and articulate who can't serve and why. They say specifically, Trump re respectfully renews his request that the court employ the hybrid method we've talked about, which would differentiate between the potential jurors who conclude that they cannot be fair and impartial and others who conclude that they are otherwise unable to serve due to, for example, religious observations or job obligations and prepaid travel and family arrangements and so on, saying the court should bifurcate the process so the record is clear about the quantity and the identity by juror number, right? So we don't know how crystal clear this was of jurors who excused themselves on the first basis. So who raised their hand for, do you hate Trump? Yes, okay, I gotta go. And who raised their hand for I'm just really busy and I don't, you know, I don't want to be here because I got to take care of my mom, my kids, my dogs, my work, whatever. And we want to know that percentage is right. So if you put this all on a pie chart, what percentage of the, the default jurors who work their way into court automatically hate Trump. And it's, I think it's big. I think the number was like the people who get definitely left. And I don't know that we bifurcated between the two and the numbers, but it was like over half of the 92 are gone huge numbers of people. So they're gonna, they want that data to make the argument that this is a rigged jurisdiction by default, just starting from zero. Now the, that clarity is necessary so that Trump can present arguments to the first department in the court of appeals if and when, if necessary, regarding the number of potential jurors who believe they harbored a disqualifying bias before questioning even began as well as the number of additional potential jurors who reveal a disqualifying bias during questioning. We wanna know what the pie chart looks like. These figures are extremely significant to assessing the constitutional and the statutory adequacy of the jury selection process. Like if you're picking from a tainted pool, is that really due process? Is that really equal protection of the law? Oh, we're gonna give you a jury, but every single person in the jury panel hates your guts. You got a jury. What are you talking about? It's due process. Happened to be from Berkeley. 
but it's a jury, right? And that's what they keep telling us. They keep saying, well, I mean, it's a judge. It's like every judge is the same. Okay, it's like, why? Because you put on a robe, that means you suddenly can't be a partisan hack? Uh, no, not true at all. In fact, it subjects you to higher scrutiny. You should be under a bigger microscope, not less. And above reproach, not even, not smack dab in the middle of a $93 million effort by your daughter to, to raise money against this, your defendant in your courtroom. So these figures are, are extremely significant, including the impact of the extraordinarily prejudicial pretrial publicity that's already been associated with this case, which we identified in the pending adjournment motion that we already submitted to you previously. Talking about venue change motion, saying, can we please just move this? And if it's such a strong case, move it to Texas, see how it goes there. And second, Trump's defense says, while we agree that whether a potential juror likes or does not like Trump is not the central focus of jury selection, it is pretty well established that a potential juror's negative opinion is a form of actual bias. Okay, law says that. In Torpy, quote, a negative opinion at issue included actual bias from the defendant's association allegedly with some group. And so affiliations that could give rise to bias are similarly important in this case. We had question 29, which was the court's questionnaire that, that asks about connections to any other political entity affiliated with Trump, which is a fairly direct inquiry about the Republican Party. On the other hand, however, 29E and H only ask about anti-Trump groups. Now, people can have political or policy views that lead to a disqualifying bias without being anti-Trump, right? If you're pro-Biden, by definition, you're anti-Trump, right? So there are people would say, no, I'm not a part of an anti-Trump group. I just don't like insurrection. But what does Trump have to do with that? Well, you say he was the leader of that, okay? So, but, oh, okay, so, but it's not an anti-Trump group. I just like, you know, uh, weird books for kids. I just like weird books with snuffleupagus or whatever, you know, waving around all over the place, whatever for children to read. You're like, what? Okay, well, that's, that's sort of adverse to the other side. And so you're necessarily kind of anti-Trump if you take those policy positions. This is the problem with having political trials. You understand this is why we don't do this in this country, idiot Democrats, thanks. Thus, the questionnaire benefits the District of New York, the prosecutors, by identifying people who affiliate with President Trump's political party. Identify the Republicans and nuke them, and then you give a much narrower anti-Trump disqualifier, right? Big, broad disqualifiers for the right, and then very narrow disqualifiers for the groups on the left, which we pointed out when the questionnaire dropped. The, the questionnaire lacks a similarly broad inquiry to identify potential jurors who also ally with rival political parties that are not necessarily anti-Trump either, but could still support a disqualifying bias worthy of follow-up by the defense. To the extent that the court fails to remedy this asymmetry in the questionnaire, the defense counsel must be permitted leeway to probe those affiliations during the, during the jury selection process, which of course we'll pick back up on tomorrow. Now they say Trump also maintains his objection to the broader approach of jury selection that would also permit jurors to self-identify who's unable to serve, to excuse themselves without further inquiry. Like you don't get to voluntarily remove yourself. We respectfully submit that under the circumstances of this case, the courts experience that quote, the vast majority of jurors in other cases who reach that conclusion are in fact excused is not an adequate basis here. And the judge has definitely done this. I'm pretty sure, right? They're saying you don't get to just wave off a whole panel of people because it's convenient for you. It's not an adequate basis to refrain from conducting an individualized inquiry to determine whether the statutory four cause standard is met in this case, right? We should ask every one of them. We don't just take their word for it. And Trump's team wants to do that for a couple of reasons. One, I think to drag out jury selection for as long as possible, which would delay this case uh, even longer. But also, well, I think it will help them identify the data they need to make the point that venue is problematic and that the entire panel, the demographic is so bad 
people don't just, you know, you don't get to get off easy. You don't want to be here. Why? Make them say it because I hate Trump. Okay, good. You're gone. Next. I hate Trump. Oh, good. You're gone too. I hate Trump. Oh, perfect. See? You don't just get to wave them off, right? You want to show how bad and how de deep the anti-Trump bias ultimately is. And so that went out into the court. And of course, we're already in the middle of jury selection right now. And so we'll see how it picks up tomorrow. But what it seems like has been happening is the judge has asked, I think, a couple of different questions for the initial panels. One is anti-Trump bias or any reason you can't be fair you know, or impartial automatically. And two are more of the procedural objections. But then he's waving them off, right? We're not getting individualized questioning on each juror who decides that they want to go. So who actually made it onto the panel thus far? We got a couple of different reports to take a look at. One is from our friend Technofog. You know who he is. He's on X and everywhere. This is from his Substack, which I am subscribed to. And you'll notice he gave us some background on each juror. And so we'll take a look at this one and we'll get another report from, I think, ABC, who was also there reporting. So juror one, who is this guy? Going to be selected first. And so he was the foreman. He lives in West Harlem, but is originally from Ireland. Huh. He works in sales, previously worked as a waiter, attended some college, married, Spouses in school, no kids. Now, in his spare time, he enjoys doing anything outdoorsy. Nice. He gets his news from the New York Times, the Daily Mail, some Fox News, and MSNBC as well. So a male, who knows, maybe a little bit younger, middle-aged, married, no kids, outdoor stuff. So he's spry, hiking all over the place. Okay, from Ireland. Juror two, native New Yorker lived in the Upper East Side for the past three years. She has a master's degree in nursing and has been an oncology nurse at a large hospital for 15 years. She's married, has no children, lives with her fiance who works in finance. She enjoys spending time with her family and friends and taking her dog to the park. She gets her news from New York Times, CNN, Google, and Facebook. Now, juror number two also stated, I don't really have an opinion on President Trump said, well, he'll be treated as anyone else can be treated. And quote, no one is above the law. Uh-oh. We know what that is. That's a Democrat platitude that's meaningless because a ton of people are above the law. Joe Biden's above the law. Hillary Clinton's above the law. Uh, Hunter Biden's above the law in many ways. He's now kind of getting uh, you know brought under the law because he's so stupid. But a lot of people are above the law. Mike Pence is above the law. We have... Uh, Michael Sussman's above the law, in my opinion. He was tried and acquitted, but you know they don't get charged for crimes. Very strange how that works. So many people are above the law. Trump is below the law. Trump doesn't even get time for discovery. He doesn't get due process. He doesn't even get to speak. He's gagged unconstitutionally. So he's way below the law. So juror two is going to be a problem. Okay, we know that's a stupid platitude that they say all the time. No one's above the law. It's weird. How come people can destroy evidence? Why can Liz Cheney and the J6 committee destroy evidence? And there's no repercussions for that. Why? Because they're privileged because of Congress. Hmm. Now, she further stated that she did not have an opinion on Trump before she walked. He she walked into the courtroom. I am here for my civic duty. I'm here to listen to the facts. She said she was here to do her civil duty. Yeah, right. All right. So she got the talking points from Liz Cheney. Juror three. He's likely in his early 30s. He's originally from Oregon and works as a corporate lawyer. He's Asian. He gets his news from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Google. He's aware of Trump's other criminal cases, but is not super familiar with the other charges. Hmm. Juror five is after juror four, who says, juror four said he found Trump to be fascinating and mysterious. Kind of sounds like Eugene Carroll. You're fascinating, Anderson. <laughs> Uh, when he's like, cut the tape, cut the tape. Commenting on juror, on Trump, juror four said, he walks into the room and he really sets people off one way or another. And I find that really interesting. Really, this one guy can do all of this? Wow, that's what I think. <laughs> Just totally enamored by the whole process, amazing. Juror five is a black woman, she's in her 20s said she's not really a political person, though her friends have strong opinions on Trump, likely negative though. She stated she tries to avoid political conversations, doesn't really care for the news, it's a lot I know. 
She does appreciate Trump's candor, says President Trump speaks his mind, and I'd rather that than someone who's in office who you don't know what they're thinking. Hey. Now, she was unaware that Trump faced charges in other criminal cases, but she knows now. And juror six is a software engineer, also likely in her 20s. She says she has no strong feelings about Trump either way, but says, I'll be fair and impartial. She's unmarried, has no kids, lives with three roommates in Chelsea, and she gets her news from the Times, Google, Facebook, and TikTok, and they are all there listed. Now, of course, I'll encourage you to go over to Technofog to read his thoughts and his analysis. He's an attorney, does great uh, commentary on this stuff. So go subscribe to him, technofog.substack.com to continue to follow along. And I've subscribed to his work as well. But let's see what else the mainstream media had to say about this. This was from ABC. And we've got seven jurors on this list. So here's what they got. And part of the problem here is everybody's catching different stuff, right? We're all sort of uh, listening for the live tweets and different pool reports are coming out. There's people watching it. So everybody's catching different bits of information. And so we're trying to assemble it here and piece it together. But again, juror one, middle-aged salesman from Ireland, going to serve as the foreman, outdoor stuff. And he once worked as a waiter, but been in sales for the last three decades. So maybe he can kind of be persuasive to the jury, right? He's a four person and he's the salesperson. Hmm. When asked if he was aware of Trump's other cases, yeah, I heard of some of them. Juror two didn't realize she would be in Trump's criminal trial. Said, I didn't know I was walking into this. Oncology nurse, lives with her fiance, enjoys walking her dog. What's your opinion of Trump? I really don't have one, but no one's above the law. Juror three, corporate lawyer, moved to, from Oregon five years ago, works at two major white shoe law firms in New York, which are gonna be notoriously liberal, right? He said he, and that's just, this, that's just the trend in any law firm anywhere, put it in New York, oh gosh. He said he normally gets his news from the Times in his spare time, hiking and running. When asked about the case, he suggested he would infer suggested that he could infer the former president's intent without, quote, reading his mind. However, he was embarrassed to admit he was not very familiar with the allegations against Trump. He says, you know, I'm actually not familiar with the other charges. I don't really follow the news that closely. A little embarrassing to say. Juror four is the fascinating and mysterious one. Originally from Puerto Rico, he has lived in the Lower East Side for the last 40 years, also self-employed IT consultant, attended one year of college, has been married for a long time, has two grandchildren. He says, I have no spare time. My hobby is my family. My previously, he previously served on a civil case, doesn't recall the verdict, gets his news from the Daily News, New York Times, etc. Juror five was the only potential juror who raised her hand when lawyers asked if they've ever heard of Trump's other criminal cases and said, yeah, I kind of like that he speaks his mind. She's a lifelong New Yorker, currently works as an ELA teacher, in charter school, lives in Harlem, master's degree in education, lives with her brother, works as a basketball coach. In her spare time, she enjoys writing in theater. She normally gets her news from Google and TikTok. Listen, man, TikTok, man. Listens to inspirational podcasts and sometimes listens to the Breakfast Club radio. She said that she doesn't really care for the news. Two family members worked in law enforcement, including a godfather, worked as a homicide sergeant for New York PD, NYPD. Interesting. Juror six. Software engineer works at the Walt Disney Company. She grew up in New York City, lives in Chelsea, three roommates. Says she gets her news from the Times and TikTok as well. In her spare time, enjoys plays, restaurants, dancing, and watching TV. I'll be fair and impartial, she said, in response to the question about Trump's candidacy. Would that impact your ability to serve? She says no. And juror seven, we got two lawyers. Wow. Juror seven is a second white shoe lawyer to serve on Trump's jury. Currently lives in the Upper East Side, enjoys spending time outdoors. He gets the news from the Times, the Post, Journal, and Washington Post, and he's never served on a jury. He said he did support some of Trump's policies as president, but he disagreed with others. Says, I don't know the man, and I don't have opinions about him personally, he said, which, okay. You know, it's kind of what you can ask for. So uh, we had some people we were really concerned about, like the prosecutor yesterday and the severed head woman yesterday and some other curious Facebook post people 
who had some uh, troubling things. Now, I think juror two may have been the one who was also in the Biden celebration parade. I'm not, I'm not positive about that, but there was that other juror who was part of the Biden celebration parade who we, I think, uh, remained on the panel, but we're still piecing it all together. But one juror was excused, will not be on the panel. Her name is Kara McGee, this woman here. We've got two clips, one of her doing a long form interview that we'll listen to several minutes of, and then a shorter clip from our friend Viva, who caught her on the street, not him personally, but got grabbed this clip for us, and then see what she says about being excused and what the whole process was like. Cara, so thank you. here is her interview with the folks over at CNN. Thank you for joining us. Everyone is so eager to understand what it was like to even be called for jury duty today. When did you realize that this was the Trump trial? So uh, definitely not when I first got the jury letter. Um, that, that was kind of the standard open your mailbox, like, oh, I have to take off work in two weeks. Um, but uh, so when I, I texted my mom and said, oh, I got jury duty, uh, and she said, starting what day? And I said, April 15th, tax day. Uh, and she said, I think that's when the Trump trial starts. Um, so I was wondering if I would be on that or on some other case at the same time, you know, in the building, because I assume there's a lot more going on. Um, and then yesterday when I got here and we were put into a jury holding room um, and it seemed like there were 500-ish people waiting to get put into two separate holding rooms. Um, I had the thought of like, this is probably Trump because I don't think they'd call quite this many jurors for anything else. So. Yeah. so what was everyone doing when they realized, like you at that point, that you were likely a part of the Trump jury trial pool of people? Were people talking amongst themselves? Was there kind of a buzz in the air? You could feel that people were starting to realize it, but people weren't talking amongst themselves nearly as much as I expected. Weirdly enough, um, I think everyone It's tense. Hopefully everybody realizes what's happening. Uncertainty over what yeah. the protocols were in this situation, and so no one really felt like they should mention it. Um, I'm sure there were some jurors who just didn't know that this was happening right now or didn't realize um, that this was what they were called for. Um, you could definitely see people kind of looking around, like, do other people also get the sense that this is... But... Um, not not really talking about it. When you no. walked in the courtroom and you saw him, is that when you first learned that for sure this was a Trump trial? And how did it feel to see him? So in the initial jury holding room, um, one of the, uh, I guess, employees of the court had mentioned something about it being an unusual day. And I I kind of wondered, like, does that mean we're definitely on this case or, or just because this, this case is also in the building? So yeah, it was when when we walked into the courtroom and saw him, that it was, uh, that I was sure that it was definitely this case. Did he make eye contact with you? Yes, yeah. What was that like? Odd. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's someone- Did your eyes burn out of your skull when you looked at the insurrectionist in chief? Who you've seen as this larger than life public figure for, a decade or so at this point and for for people who have followed his business career i'm sure longer than that i i didn't but um and then you get in there and it's it's fascinating because you get these two very contrasting kind of senses at at the same time which is on the one hand it's it's this very like massive sense of, of gravitas and importance because yeah. you you know that this is history in the making and whatever the outcome of this is everything going forward will be affected by it um and at the same time you you the walk into the, of the justice system, and yeah. you see trump sitting there i had never seen him in person before you see him sitting there and it's like oh it's just a guy <laughs> Um, he's, he's just a dude. Why were you dismissed? Uh, he's, yeah, he's not Godzilla or whatever they try to make him out to be. He's not this walking, you know, monster Adolf reincarnate or something. It's, he's a man just like the rest of us. I was dismissed because, so in the jury questionnaire, uh, that you answer the questions to out loud. Sorry, this is falling out. Um, 
Uh, there's one question at the end that says, uh, is there anything else that might affect uh, your ability to serve that you haven't mentioned other than all of the questions that they ask? Right. Um, so the point is that she has already gone past the question, can you be fair and impartial? Goes right through that one, gets to this next one, and answers the first one in the affirmative. Yes, of course I can. And I said the nature of my job would make it very difficult for me to be here from nine to five for at least six weeks and probably longer. Um, it's not really something that I can entirely do, you know, by myself in the hours from five to whenever uh, after being. It was that the reason day. you thought that they dismissed you? Was it clear to you why? So. I believe so. It was. It was right after that question that the Did they tell said. you why they dismissed you at all. Uh, no, but it. Other jurors that were dismissed due to an answer to a specific question, it was always right after that question where the judge asked the two legal teams um, if there were objections to dismissing the juror. Um, so I assume it was not prior questions, but I can't be sure of that. Kara, thank you so much for stopping okay. by. I really informed it. Interesting. Okay, so we're trying to piece together. How did she get excused ultimately? She may have gone, it sounds like she went through her, her line, uh, her list of questions. She was in cybersecurity and all these things. So she goes through her list and at the end, well, I might be very busy. Any objection to excusing her? No. So she was on, it sounds like she made it past the first round of questions, right? So she's now getting asked a series of, of the prior questions. She's not around anymore. And it's only because of a technical problem. She's way too busy. So Viva flagged this one for us, says, you know, this is one of the prospective jurors who assured us that she could be unbiased. She was dismissed because of her schedule. But that was the secondary reason. She says, I could have been objective and unbiased, right? This is what she says to everyone. She wants to talk to everybody. She's had a, she did a ton of interviews yesterday, was on with CNN, saw her all over the place. Here she's talking to someone else. Here she, her response. Can you share your opinion of, of the former president and, and, and why you felt <laughs> that you could be unbiased? Uh, I'm not a fan. Oh. Um, I, during uh, COVID-19, I lived with someone who was immunocompromised, and I think his handling of COVID-19 was uh, <laughs> abysmal. Um, I also, I have a sister who is adopted from China, and um, the comments he made about China when he was Whoa! president um, made her very anxious, and therefore made me angry. Um, there policies he has supported um, that regard uh, women and, and reproductive health that I do not agree with. Um, Anything else? And I think all of that needs to be addressed. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I hate everything. What are you talking about? Okay, so she, so did you hear, by the way, what the question was before she went on that little ranting screed? So the first question was, what's your opinion? How can you be unbiased? And she just went to give us a whole litany of all the reasons she hates Trump. Can you share your opinion of, of the former president and, and, and why you felt <laughs> that you could be unbiased? Okay, uh, even the question is, why did you think you could be unbiased? And she just goes to just roast him, okay, for a full 60 seconds. It's insane. These people are demented. They're deluded. They have no real... Uh, capability to judge themselves she's like feral against trump and she was all i guess almost on the panel if her schedule would have accommodated she would have been on the panel it's nuts this is why you don't have political prosecutions he's never going to get a fair jury the only hope is by some miracle you get one who's on the opposite side of the standard narrative that the demographics provide for in new york and the courts and the government they're doing everything they can to weed those people out now, we have to talk about George Conway. Now, I don't know what's going on with this dude. He's always been a strange fellow. And something's happened to him. And I think you can probably tell what it is from that gif. But let's watch this in action. Here's George Conway, who is probably going through a midlife crisis or something on MSNBC.
During that jury selection, the judge gave Donald Trump and his attorney a warning about Trump's behavior. It came after one potential juror was being questioned about her Facebook post after the 2020 election. Once she left the room, the judge admonished Trump, telling his lawyers, quote, your client was audibly uttering something. I will not tolerate that. I will not have any jurors intimidated in this courtroom. I want to make that no, crystal no, 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 no. clear. Okay. That's the okay, judge thanks, talking judge. directly to Donald Trump and his right, lawyer. So, uh, George, we we knew about the histrionics a couple of days ago. Some more, it looks like there was yesterday inside that courtroom. How does that play? How does that affect what's happening inside the courtroom? Well, again, I mean, it's great that the judge is is clamping down on that early because his conduct in the courtroom. What's he uh, doing? What is going on with that? You see it, right? It's the hair. What's he doing with this hairdo, man? He, it's a little kind of Trumpian kind of flowing naturally, bursting all over the place. This is different. He ch is trying to be like Trump. They all are, okay? On MSNBC, there's the other woman who dyes her hair blonde for crying out loud. Every night after the show, she just goes in there and dumps some more bleach in there. Now he's fluffing his hairdo out, man. It's turning into a little Trumpy. And I went and I did a couple of screenshots of this just, just, just to confirm I wasn't going insane, but here is what he normally looks like, okay? This is George. That's his normal hairdo, right? Here's a little bit more of a recent one. Look, that's the hairdo. What's going on? He's trying to fluff it up, you know? He's trying to do the casual wind blowing through your hair mega do, all right? He's not pulling it off nicely, but they're all going through something, man. They're going through, look at him, he looks strange. They're all going through a weird time in their lives that early because his conduct in the courtroom um, is really it's it's very demonstrative and it's very emotional at times and I don't I actually don't think he has a complete ability to control himself uh, I think we saw that during the e why are you trying to be like him then George why are you trying to mimic him all right we're gonna see you in a red tie soon huh Jean Carroll trial I think we're going to see it again and I think it's important for the judge to give him warnings that he can't do that in front of the jury but the fact is to the extent he does that to the in front of the jury it shows disrespect for the jury and doesn't necessarily help him and that's one of the reasons why I think that he was hit with that 83.3 .3 million dollar verdict during the second E. Jean Carroll trial as he basically stood he sat in front of the jury and just showed contempt for the entire process well it should it, it, it's not not legitimate what is he going to do sit there and say thank you for this illegitimate process George he has his free speech he's allowed to talk about it until your team gags him so he's going through something right the hairdo change the other side he is probably trying to get it back together after his wife left him because she was able to move on find somebody much better than him so he's having to recreate himself George you're never going to be Donald Trump okay you're never going to get her back we know you want her back. She's not coming back, okay? Just move on, go back to your old hairdo, and just deal with it, man. Get a counselor or something. All right, now, what's happening next? Judge Murkan, as we know, has issued a new court date, a deadline for a response for Donald Trump and his defense. Remember, Trump has been ordered to appear for a contempt of court proceeding, you see, this is what Judge Murkan submitted in, in as an order. You are now ordered to be here. District Attorney Alvin Bragg and his team now submitted a request to hold you in contempt. Ordered that pursuant to the law, Donald Trump is appearing here to show cause before the New York Supreme Court Honorable Judge Juan Murkan, so-called, on the 24th of April. I think that got moved actually to the 23rd, so it's an old order. But here is what they're going to be talking about on the 23rd. So it's should why we should not issue these different orders. The first one, holding Trump in contempt with a fine of $1,000 for Trump's willful violation of the gag by posting on True Social on April 10th at 10.07 a.m. That's count one. Count two holding the defendant in contempt for another true social post at 1048, another thousand dollars. 
And number three, he posted another one in violation of the gag order on April 13th at 1256 PM as well. Now ordered that any copies of this, as well as the people's motion for contempt from Bragg shall be submitted by April 16th. And we read that one yesterday from the government that came out. And then uh, also the response by the Trump defense is going to be due by this Friday, April 19th. And of course, we'll be covering that as soon as it drops, saying any papers shall be served on Bragg's office. Get those documents in by April 19th and we'll be reviewing them. So, of course, we'll be covering that. Now, you may remember this guy, old Kev McCarthy. Where's he been? He always likes to emerge when the house is in total disarray. He's kind of like, I told you, you know, I told you so, whatever. So he's out. He's commenting on the Trump trial. Here's what he said when they brought him back on the media. It tells you that uh, this is probably going to backfire on the Democrats. I mean, yeah. if this was a Hollywood movie, you wouldn't believe the script. Think for one moment. Let, let, let's design a movie. You're president of the United States. Your policies are so bad, you can't run on your economic policy, your foreign policy, or your border policy. So let's come up with a plan. Let's try your opponent, but let's take away his First Amendment rights and say, we care about democracy, but we'll give him none. But let's try him, not by a jury of his peers. Let's pick the second best county in the entire nation where you got the most Democratic votes in your last election. And then let's make sure he can't campaign and you still lose as that opponent, President Trump, goes out simply to a bodega and the American public chant, we love Trump four more years. That's right, baby, four more years. So we're gonna see how Trump capitalizes upon this. And they're probably working away on something right now because it's gonna be a long five, six weeks to go as the trial continues ahead. And so my friends, we're gonna be here continuing to cover this. Thank you for subscribing as we do. Thanks for inviting someone you know or love to come check out our channel, to join you on a live stream. Thanks for sharing a short form video with them so that they can see what is happening here as well. We got great links down in the description below. We'd love to have you join us beyond just this video over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, our members only community where we do some extra content in the mornings, extra live streams six days a week, including on Saturdays. We'd love to have you join us watching the watchers.locals.com. We'll see you over there and back here on the next one. Now we're not done yet, my friends. We got one more segment to attend to, and then it will be time to hear from you and see what you say about it. But who is this guy? We remember Biden's prosecutor who left the DOJ and is now prosecuting Trump with Alvin Bragg's team is now moving to smear Donald Trump with a list of what are called prior bad acts under the criminal rules. You're allowed to bring these things in under certain situations. And Judge Juan Mercan, we know, is probably going to be gratuitous with this request. We're talking about how they can impeach Trump. If he decides to take the stand and testify, what are they going to do in response? Well, they've got a big list of some nasty stuff that they've submitted. And you're probably going to see this in the media. They're all talking about it. It's kind of a smear job to say, well, even if we can't use this material, at least you know that we know about it and the media can talk about it. And then Judge Mercon will decide you can talk about that or this or that one, but not this one and so on. So we'll go into that. But who is this guy? Now, Matthew Colangelo is kind of the hatchet man, the maybe the mastermind behind a lot of these prosecutions. We know Letitia James, not that competent. In fact, all she did, as far as we know, during the civil trial was take her shoes off and stink up the whole courtroom, according to Alina Abba. And Judge Angeron was like, I love it. No problems. And he just kind of left this whole thing go astray in his courtroom. Very strange. So she didn't do any actual work. Then Colangelo, before he went to Tish's office, he was already over with the Obama DOJ. This is something he was there. He was there for a long time under Eric Holder, then went over to Tish then was there, created all of a, a whole slew of prosecutions against Trump, then left, went to the Biden DOJ. Many people like Julie Kelly and others say that he was the brains behind the Florida prosecution that launched that whole thing. And then he left and went over to Alvin Bragg's office. All prosecuting Trump. 
So that's the guy who is writing this ridiculous motion that we're gonna take a look at before we get some reaction from Weissman and Bill Barr, who's actually on Team Trump on this one. So we'll get to it. But here is what the filing looks like. And there's a lot of you know nasty stuff in here. It's written by Matthew Colangelo, and it serves two purposes. One is to smear Trump in the court of public opinion. The other is to try to get this stuff in front of the jury. Now we know who the jury is based on the prior segment, at least seven of them. We still have a ways to go, but they want them to know every single bad thing Trump has ever done, okay? Every time that he didn't put the lid down, they wanna know about it so that they can tell that to the jurors and look at all the women and say, see, you almost fell in because of him. Trump did it. So here is what Colangelo says. They call it in New York a Sandoval notice. They say the people hereby disclose a list of all misconduct and criminal acts of Trump that are not charged in the indictment. Okay, so this has nothing to do with this case at all, but you just go around, you talk about all the bad things that you can find, and they say the people brag and Colangelo, which is Biden's prosecutor, they intend to use that trial to impeach the credibility of the defendant pursuant to the law, right? So to impeach him, if, if, Trump chooses to testify, then we're going to ask him about all of these following things. This is what they intend to ask. Now we can battle over this, right? So the defense will come out and they'll say, no, this is not relevant. You can't, this should be precluded. You can't talk about this or the other thing. But then it's up to Murkan, the judge, to decide whether or not to allow it. And it's going to be a free for all. We already saw this pattern. If Trump testifies in the Tish case where Angeron said that even if stuff was precluded by the statute of limitations, even if it was legally impermissible to talk about it, you could still talk about it to show a pattern in a course of conduct. So here right now, what happens in all of these things is they parlay them, they, they, they snowball, you, you get Trump on a little bit of a legal problem and then that parlays into another one. You just you know, roll it over into the next one. So what I mean is, we're now at the criminal trial, and now they've got this entire dossier of other things they can talk about because they've been prosecuting Trump endlessly since 2016. So it's like their greatest hits list, right? And it's by Matthew Colangelo, which is why I spent time on this slide explaining who this guy is. He's been, he's been creating all of these for years. Everything we're about to go through, this dude's been involved in. He's like, yeah, um, I also prosecuted that one, and I led that one, and I led this one. Okay, so it is a... Pro is a partisan prosecution. This is not a normal prosecutor. This is somebody who is making it their entire career to follow a solo defendant around. Not working at 20 years in Manhattan or you know 20 years at the DOJ, following him around to take him out. That's not justice, my friends, in America. Democrats are insane to believe otherwise. So here is what he says. Here's what he wants to get in front of the jury, talking about the Tish case, which we know was a hack job, but he's going to say Trump was found by some due process to have done the following. He persistently falsified business records. So they're going to pretend like this was a legitimate case. And they also say Trump testified untruthfully. And because the judge Angeron, who is as corrupt as can be, says that Trump, his testimony was hollow and untrue. So the judge Angeron called Trump a liar. And so they're putting that in. Hey, we want to call Trump a liar too, because one of our hack judge judges gave us this excuse to do that. See how this works? Same thing happening here. Trump intentionally violated a court order, got fined $10,000 for talking about the judge's greenfield that was sitting right next to him. We don't know where their hands were, if they were above the table or not, or below the table. We don't know. They moved the cameras though, according to the defense. So we don't really know. It's an open question. I don't know what was going on there. If they had cameras on, we could see. But since they moved the cameras, no, it's just, you know, their word against our speculation. And so who knows? Defendant violated the order by failing to remove untrue disparaging posts that Allison Greenfield was literally like hugging Chuck Schumer, right, in her photos, standing right next to him, at least, right, in the same photographs, running for office and all the things. We also have... Trump committed persistent fraud. All of this is just fake stuff that they created out of thin air with anger on. And now they want to use it in this trial because he rubber stamped it. Jury also award another fake case. Jury also awarded 83 million. Trump defamed her on that one. Lawrence Kaplan, another New York case. 
And they're going to say, okay, Trump also abused her. Trump made a false statement on True Social. Remember that she got more money for being defamed than allegedly from being pursed in a Bergdorf's. It's insane. Trump versus Clinton. Court sanctioned him, ordered him to pay a hundred, uh, a million bucks for a bad faith lawsuit, right? He sued Hillary. That one got dismissed. Had to pay a million bucks. Trump versus the corporation or people versus the corporation. This is from 2022, probably when he was at Tisha's office. Trump Corp and Trump Payroll convicted of, of fraud. Alan Weisselberg went to prison. Guess who's there? Colangelo. Trump uh, people by James versus Trump. Another one. 2016, some elite, $2 million for breach of fiduciary duty. And there was another stipulation about administration of charitable assets. So they just go, they drag everything out, out possible and they try to smear him with it if he dares to testify. So all that got submitted by Joe Biden's prosecutor, an anti-Trump, it's actually probably really an Obama prosecutor, just do, does whatever they say. And so the people's motions in limine already disclosed the misconduct and the uncharged criminal acts, which we're gonna use as substantive proof here, but to the extent that the court concludes in resolving those motions in limine, that the identified acts may not be admitted as proof, the people hereby give notice we intend to use these acts to impeach the credibility of the defendant if you'll let us. And of course, you know, the, the question is on these things, is it relevant? Is it, uh, does it matter to the, you know, to the case? Is it more prejudicial than probative? Is it more harmful to the case? Does it help the jury decide the issues or does it just bring them confusion? So we'll see what Mercon does. Anything to hurt Trump, I think he'll allow in, which is basically all of those. So we'll see where it goes. Of course, that is from Colangelo. And not only that, right, not only are they trying to use their fake hack prosecutions that were governed by Angeron and Kaplan to snowball this, they then gag him, require him to be bogged down at trial for six weeks in the middle of a campaign. But then even when Trump goes out and says something, to the media, they are going to use that against him, right? You've heard it in the movies. Anything you say or do can and will be used against you in a court of law. So here's Weissman and these weirdos on MSNBC giddy about this. Every time he comes out and makes a statement, they just say, oh, good, he's incriminating himself. He's making an admission that's going to cause more evidence to be available to use against him in the court of law. I used to say, good luck to you. You know, that's that I don't think is going to fly. But I just thought it was fascinating that he couldn't keep the story straight, which has got to be the accountant did it. I didn't do it, but it, he started out by saying, this is what I did. That is not going to be great. It'll be interesting to see whether the prosecution actually tries to use that because it's an admission. That mm -hmm. tape that you just played is something that is potentially admissible. And, and he's going to do some version of that pretty much every day. Out yep. there. Uh, well, we, you know, just to be clear, we saw that when Rudy Giuliani did that um, and the evidence of what he said outside of court was played mm -hmm. in the civil case, the civil defamation case that he lost. The same thing happened in the Eugene Carroll case where you, all those statements are admissible. They're admissible missions. Um, and so this is one where you're seeing, again, no client control. Um, and so he could really hurt himself. Um, but, you know, he only has himself to blame. Only has himself to blame. You guys are prosecuting him in the mi middle of a political campaign. You all orchestrated that to happen. In fact, Judge Mercon was was colluding with Judge Chutkin to get it done. Her case was supposed to go forward. Then when it didn't go forward, they had a phone call or whatever, however they communicated. And suddenly he brought his case back up from the dead. Interesting how that works. And they all timed it to coincide with the election because they don't want him to speak. If he defends himself against this, they'll just use it against him. And they'll gag him and threaten him with contempt for even responding to any of the other people who can talk about it. And if he does it again, they'll threaten him with jail. That's the Democratic Party in America. That's who these people are. They think this is fair. They think that they're non-biased. They think they're unpartisan. And they pat each other on the back over it. So here now is Bill Barr, who is going to be right, I know, for once in a while. He is. Here's what he says. I've said from the beginning, this, this case is an abomination. You know, it's obviously political. Seven years after he pays hush money to try to come up with this case. It's also, as you say, it's not only far-fetched, it, it, they're trying to predicate it on a federal crime, 
which wasn't prosecuted, and they're wrong about it. This was not uh, a, a campaign contribution. They're just wrong on the law. But to me, this shows uh, that the real threat to liberty, uh, the real threat to our system, are the excesses of the progressive mm. left. They, they're perverting the system of justice, uh, and you know that's where the danger lies: the corruption and subversion of our institutions by the left. Uh, I heard. Yeah, and a lot of that wouldn't be happening if we had an actual investigation in 2020 which is where the perversion of all of our institutions ultimately started. And that led to J6, which resulted in a further corruption and any faith in our institutions. And so the snowball continues to roll down the mountain. But Bill, you were in there for a while. You could have stopped some of this and you didn't. I just call this hush money case outrageous. Um, and I also know you've been asked many times, you've had your disagreements with the former president. Um, he's the presumptive nominee. We assume he will be the nominee. Will you support him in 2024? Well, I've said all along, you know, given two bad choices, I think it's my duty to pick the person I think would do the least harm to the country. And in, in my mind, that's, uh, I will vote the Republican mm, ticket. You I will. will support the Republican ticket. I think the real danger Thanks, to the Bill. country, the real danger to democracy, as I say, is the progressive agenda. And uh, while Trump, and I said, uh, Trump may be uh, playing Russian roulette, but uh, continuation of the Biden administration is national suicide. That is opinion. true. Yes. Hey, when you're right, you're right, man. You can't disagree with that. It is a national suicide. And that's, it's a wild thing to think about that. But it's a, it's a bizarre world to realize that people might go into the polling booths and say, this is great. Everything that's happening right now is great. I love all this conflict in the Middle East. Love paying $25 for a turkey sandwich love unfettered illegal immigration. I hate having a sound currency and a functional dollar. I love having a president who's sniffing kids, you know, doesn't even know where he is, leading our country and being a symbol of America. Great times ahead. Can't wait to vote for Joe. It's like, what on earth? Who are these people? So Biden prosecutor Matthew Colangelo now increasing the pressure, trying to say if Trump testifies, they're going to try to smear him with a bunch of this. Trump will have a response, of course, when that drops. We'll be here to cover it. And so thank you for joining us as we do, my friends. Don't forget to subscribe wherever it is you're watching this. Really great way to make sure we can stay connected. Thanks for inviting someone over that you know or love to come and join us when we go live. We also have great links down in the description below, including our members only community where we go live in the mornings talking about a bunch of other stuff that we can't squeeze in here on the live streams. And we do streams on Saturday as well. So come and check it out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We have an amazing community. We want to see you become a part of it. We'll see you over there and back here on the next one. All right, my friends. Well, that is going to be it for us on the day. We're not in trial, and so a little bit of a shorter show, but we'll be back tomorrow with a full day of jury selection. Today, we covered Biden's prosecutor attacking Trump with all of you know the irrelevant fake fake cases that they brought against him and Trump objecting to the jury process as jurors are now sitting on with CNN for four minutes talking about how like they're a neutral part of the process and then turning around and blasting Trump on every single issue saying that they're fair and impartial and George Conway is really trying hard uh, to, to get her back. We'll see if that works for him. But my friends, now it's time to hear from you. Let's see what you have to say about this. Thank you so much for your amazing donos and your support. Very grateful for them over on Locals and over on the YouTubes and elsewhere. Thank you so much, my big, beautiful friends. Let's see. What do we have in the house on the day? Oh, we got a George Conway meme. Oh man, that's gonna be good. Hey, what's going on? X isn't working? Uh, X? X wasn't working. All right, let's see. Here we are, starting the day off. Hey, Crash is in the house. Crash says, see my comment for, oh, I have it right here. Here's Crash. Here's what he says from Crash. Great comment. Says, the word count exceeded the max for a dono. Oh, actually, here. I should have known better. Donut, mind me, is already on top of it. Boom. Crash wrote this. The word count exceeded the max for the dono, so here it is. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. 
But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Thomas Paine, The American Crisis, 1776. Whoo, baby, that's good. That's good. The summer soldier and sunshine patriot are defined in Shays' Rebellion. Good one, man. That's a good one. Good stuff. You know, great Americans before us, my friends, have been here ahead of us. And so we do have the strength and the energy to persevere through it. And we're going to. We're going to, baby. Crash, thank you for that. I'm, I'm energized, baby. Let's go. Shout out to Thomas Paine and Crash. Good comment. We got this one from Glocky says, the Republic and the rule of law doesn't exist anymore. Just once in my life, can the Republicans in Congress just start calling Democrats what they are? A bunch of fascist clowns. Prosecutor in California dropped a bombshell, drops bombshell election data case because it might help Trump. Sounds about right. Thank you, Glocky. NY says, on MSNBC DC, an expert said he feels that Mercon chose Wednesday off to prevent three-day campaign weekends for Trump so he can't easily campaign. Wow, yeah. I was trying to wonder about that. You know, there was another thought on this that the reason he's not taking Fridays off is because of the Jewish Orthodoxy community in New York. So like, what, what's the strategic reason for not having Fridays available? One, you avoid three-day weekends. The other is because there's a lot of orthodoxy Jews there who happen to be pretty big fans of Trump. And they need to, uh, you know, close down for Fridays. And he has trial on Friday so that they cannot participate. You know what I mean? Something like that. Like, what's, what's with that? Interesting com conversation. Glocky McGlock is here. Says, I'm old enough to remember Democrats screaming about a Russian behind every bush and running the White House. Now they force taxpayers to pay for illegals and their vacations. Hey, what's up? Shout out to our friend Amuse on X, great account, and a, and, a, and a person. He's more than an account. He's a friend. Open Border says illegal aliens from Russia are provided free airline tickets to explore the U.S. Tickets are provided by Democrat NGOs funded by the Biden regime. The illegals are on an all expense paid vacation. No doubt. Hey, what's up, Mike H. Membo for eight months. Eight months? I guess men can have babies. LOL. It's a little bit of a weird thing that we do here. I don't know why. But uh, yeah, we're going to have a baby, Mike, and we're just going to have to uh, deal with it. We try not to think about that component of it. Try not to think about it too hard. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> we got, hey, Sergeant GPS says, I saw my pups got a shout out last night. From you and Donut Mind Me, awesome to see. Here's a gif of Sammy doing her couch zoomies. All right, let's see if this one works. It does work. Oh, the couch zoomies. <laughs> We're familiar with these. We know these. Here's go. Get it. There you go. Right on there. Boom. A plus, 10 out of 10. Beautiful zoomies. And couch cushion in tow as well. Very good to see you there, Sergeant GPS in the house with your beautiful pups. Hey, travel agent Amy, do you need a cruise? Well, you should talk to travel agent Amy, and I'm not even joking about that, so seriously contact her. She sends me great emails. I'm like, that looks kind of fun. Someone needs to tell Trump that there are, they are illegal aliens, not migrants. Stop adopting the left's word and rebranding. Yeah, it's a great comment. It's an excellent comment. Just like an excellent deal on a cruise. Contact travel agent Amy. <laughs> Love you, travel agent. Thanks for the email. I, I really, she sent me an email. I'm like, well, those look like good cruises, honestly. Hey, hey, it's the Munkets. <laughs> and I'm, I'm laughing because I'm thinking about Fanny and uh, Nathan. It's like maybe we'll see them on a cruise together sometime. Hey, Tony, hey, Munkets. What's up, Tony? Hey, bringing in Catania, Mama Italia, five new members, Stephen E, Timmy W, Salty Old Guys here, and David W in the house. Great to see you, Tony. Hey. Thank you for bringing in five new members. Hey, what's up, Terry B? Says, everybody be sure to hit like and share with friends and make sure you subscribe and hit the bell to get notified. Thank you, Terry. It's a great reminder. And uh, 
Thank you, Terry, for that. It's a great reminder, my friends. Please follow Terry's instructions with haste. Mima's here. Oh, hi, Mima. Hey, who's coming in here? Hey, no mandates and not a Fed is here. Good, good for that. Hey, Bella E, Father Marin is here. We got Dustin D and Bill L joining us courtesy of Mima, who's a membo, bringing in new membos. Thank you, Mima, for doing that. We got Niels is here. Says Trump should campaign in New York. Yeah, I think he kind of is. Now, I'm curious to see if he's going to like make a regular Wednesday thing. You know, we didn't really see much today, I don't think. But they're probably still trying to figure out what the schedule is going to look like and whether he can, you know, squeeze something in. But I agree, he should take full advantage of it because they're, you know, basically making him a martyr. What's up from Charlie Kirk? Charlie Kirk says, how is, shout out to Charlie, says, how is Trump supposed to get a fair trial when neither the prosecutor nor the judge could even pass the jury selection process? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, we kind of had a similar thing yesterday. We're asking the judge the questions. Anybody here donate to Democrats? Anybody in this room? Judge? Uh? <laughs> Anybody's family member work for Joe Biden here? Judge? Ah, uh, busted. Yeah, you, judge. You can't make it on the panel. Sorry. Rubos. Hey, the Rubos are here. Thanks for the heads up. Says your live stream on X is not acceptable. Many reporting from around the country. Elon? All right, I'm going to send him a DM. We're going to get to the bottom of this right away. Just kidding, Elon. Don't ban me. All right, so uh, X has been weird. On Monday, it wasn't working either. So it must be something on their back end, I would imagine. It was working yesterday, but not working now. Thanks for that, the Rubos. Shout out to the Rubos. Hey, Indoctrination says, they didn't even give good logic a real review of his pleadings. I watched Joe type those up for many nights. was sickening to see them just toss it aside. Man, so send some good love and energy to good logic. He's been fighting like hell there in New York. And there have been some, you know, difficulties there. He's now seeking support, looking for support for, you know, from an, a, an assist from somebody maybe at the appellate level, because that's kind of a whole different ball game. So we'll send you over there to get the latest updates from our friend, good logic, Joe Nearman, right next door on YouTube, on rumble, on locals doing good work. As far as I know, the only journalist who even attempted to allow Trump to speak freely in 2024. So hats off to him. It's an uphill fight, right? They are trying to create an outcome, not justice. NY says, no, Rob, unbiased to them means I have something to work out and address this is the pillar of progressivism. So I think she says, I'm normal. I'm not biased. Everyone else is biased. Everyone else is wrong. I'm the default. BH says, could that video of Kara be used by the defense to show that the jury pool is tainted beyond redemption? No, the judge would just say, no, we got rid of her. Like, see, we got rid of her. She's not on the, on the, on the panel. The trial is going to be more of a sham than we all knew it would be. She was close. It sounds like the only reason from her own admission, the only reason she was off there is because of her schedule. Isn't that fun? Glocky says, this isn't a parody. Chuckles really tweeted this. Chuck Schumer sent this. Impeachment should never be used to settle policy disagreements. Okay, Chuck. Okay, you impeached Trump twice. Lady Ice says that woman from the jury is an upcoming actress. She couldn't commit to nine to five every day because she might have to work. Well, I don't know if any of that's true. I think she worked in cybersecurity. Is that right? I don't know. I don't know what, what her background is, so I don't want to falsely attribute anything to that, but she seemed like she had a real strong bias against Trump, and I was not uh, persuaded that she could be fair and impartial. Spud says, the ironic part is that there, that was a similar movie. It was called Canadian Bacon, written by Michael Moore. Yes, the Michael Moore. I remember that movie with... Um, John Candy, rest in peace. Jennifer says, "Straight, stay strong, watchers. Pray for Trump and America. Good reminder, Jennifer, right back at you. Thanks for increasing the energy levels to maximum capacities here, Jennifer. Appreciate that. Leanne, Leanne says, I don't care what kind of makeover Conway gets. He's not getting any dot, dot, dot. He's not getting any dot, dot, dot. Just Rhonda, what's up, Leanne? Thank you. Just Rhonda says, 10 new members. Thank you, Jess Rhonda. And you brought some people in yesterday too. Bringing in Patricia P. Backseat drivers here. He, he is here. E.T. 
Stephanie P, Scott M, Frank B, Trolls here, Scott W, and Laura C, all coming in courtesy of Just Rhonda, bringing in 10 new membos. Hey, we got George Conway is now playing the banjo in this new Muppet film called Fraggle Rock from George Conway. Did you guys see the hair too? Was that only me? Was I the only person who saw that? It's different, right? He's trying to be like Trump. He wants to get his wife back. I don't know what's going to work. 19 months as a membo. Oh my gosh. Colangelo moved from the Biden DOJ to prosecute Trump after Trump announced his candidacy. Doesn't that make it a Hatch Act violation? You're fired, Matt. I don't think so because he's no longer a part of that office. I think that Hatch Act is, you know, the executive really shouldn't be involved in electioneering type stuff, but he just moved offices, right? He's like a hatchet man. Yeah, strange. All right, so thank you, Raymond. 19 months as a memo, man. We've seen some stuff together, no doubt. NY says, nothing Weissman has predicted has come true. <laughs> it's true, it's true, it's true. They're pretty wrong about everything. You know, I don't know why we play them so much, but it's just weird to hear them speak. It's like, what are we talking, what are they doing over there? Okay. B.H. Williams says, we should dig into the background of Colangelo. Maybe he does have some background. You know who might have some background, some goods on that is our boy Garrett Ziegler because he can find everything on anyone. NY says, Bill Barr has changed his tune. The election is close and he's not stupid. Says Bill Barr probably can't get a dual passport. Maybe that's why he's changing his attitude. Crash says, the biggest risk our country has is not invasion from without, but it's the ROT from within. It's from debt, Rand Paul from the rot from within, from debt. Rand Paul, yesterday on Larry Kudlow. Yeah, the debt numbers, man, we talk about those sometimes, Crash, as you know, on our members only streams, we look at the charts, they're just like up and to the right or down and to the left. It's like either way, they're bad. Depends on the chart you're looking at, not good. Former says, can former POTUS Trump mention his successful cases like the Stormy case? Um, maybe to impeach her. Yeah, maybe to do a similar thing with her. The prosecution refuses to address former POTUS Trump as President Trump or as former President Trump, which is disrespectful and shoddy. Disrespectful and shoddy. And yeah, I think they do that intentionally. They call, you know, it's like, Don hey, Donald, Mr. Trump, all rise. So J Trump has to stand for Mercon, right? Who donates to his political opponent. It's sick. Fred Petamonte says, Rob, you're fascinating to talk to. Cut it. All right, cut it. Cut it. Cut it, Fred. Cut it. We got to go to commercial right now. We got to go to commercial. Cut the camera. Cut the feed. Fred's getting a little bit weird over there. Okay, that's the E. Jean Carroll. I, I get it, Fred. Hilarious. You're fascinating to talk to, Anderson. He's like, what the heck is she? Is she going to touch me? <laughs> so thank you for that one, Fred. Good one. It was a good one. Bad Poet says, when all you hear is what about Trump and Russia, Russia, Russia? A bad poet over on Rumble says, America needs to look at O Biden, O Biden, Biden, and China, China, China with a Ukraine. That would all be good to investigate. It does feel like Obama's behind a lot of this. And Colangelo, the root source, the prime uh, mover there is Obama. We got the Rubos. Hey, thank you, Rubos, who are located conveniently at rubossaltshop.com says, thank you, Rob, for all you do. Keep up the great work. The world needs you shining that big, beautiful spotlight. Rubos, thank you for that. We're grateful to have you. You guys are awesome. We love the Rubos. They have the best prayers on our locals community and they're amazing. Been around for a long time. Love you guys. Thank you. And rubosaltshop.com. Get your salt. Rob says, I'm seeing the stream on X with no problem. Hmm. So it might, yeah, I think it's just X. It's been a little wonky. I posted a copy of a seven-day poll of vote for Biden or Trump. Started out with Biden winning with about 1,200 poll votes. Now Trump is winning with 6,800 votes. Interesting. Yeah, the polls that we've been talking about on locals have been very um, dynamic. You know, close, apart, different, all the things. We're keeping our eye on those as well rubosaltshop.com. Don't put two S's in there. rubosaltshop.com. Well, you need an S for the salt and for the shop. Yeah, it's great. They're great. It's great. It's great salt too. What are you putting in your mouth? Morton's? 
class it up. If you're over 30, you got to get some real salt, okay? Trust me. All right. Hey, Rob says, I'm seeing a pattern on X. Amazing for that. And speaking of the Rubos, oh my goodness. Shout out to my beloved wife, Cheryl Lynn. You see how adorable they are? Look at this. 32 years celebrating 32 years of amazing love and marriage. Happy anniversary to the Rubos. Oh my gosh. Congratulations, you two. 32 years. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. How did you do it? All right. We need all the education, all the knowledge, the wisdom. Maybe we'll have a little life lessons with the Rubos conversation. Congratulations, you guys. That's awesome. 32 years. Cheryl Lynn Rubo. Congratulations. It's a lot of work, man. 32 years of a relationship, but not if it's with the person that you love. So shout out to the Rubos. <laughs> Good to see you guys. And celebrate my friend celebrate the rubos with some rubos salt at rubosaltshop.com all right they, they never tell me to do that okay it's just good salt and i think they're awesome people so that's all all right congratulations you guys how fun is that amazing love is in the air love is in the air all right we got this one from bad poet and zone girl zone girl says check out o'keefe's latest video about who's in charge in the white house very interesting that sounds interesting who who is it Obama? Is it new? Like today? I'll check it out. What's up, Zone Girl? Thanks for that. And Bad Poet says, Lauren Mercon, the judge's daughter, is like Hunter. If he is not strung out on crack and screwed up in the head. So when do we do, when do we know how much she started making? Well, we don't know how much she pocketed, but we know she was a part owner in the company called Authentic Campaigns, and they at least got paid like 93 million bucks from from a lot of Democrats like Adam Schiff who got censured because he's a liar. Hey, what's up? Wings of the Eagle is over on Rumble. Says, Rob, love you, man. Been listening to you since Rittenhouse. That's been a long time, brother. Thank you, Wings of Eagle. Love you back. Says, Viva gave you a shout out yesterday on Viva and Barnes. Said you really had your crap together when it comes to your intro. Well, that's good. I don't know what he's talking about. The introductions of the shows? With our mind maps? I don't know what he's talking about. But shout out to Viva Man and Barnes. They do a great stream and they're right next door. Our friends right next door. We're on the same neighborhood. Just come say hi. We've got Viva, vivabarneslaw.locals.com and they're on Rumble and they're right next door on YouTube as well. So thanks for saying that, Wings of Eagle. And thanks for being here, man, for all this time and for supporting us. It's been a lot. We've been through a lot together and we're just getting started. Hey, Wings of Eagle says, I'll eventually go out to Scottsdale one of these days to play some gorgeous golf. You play? No, unfortunately, I don't. I know. It's like one of the only lawyers in Arizona that doesn't play golf, strangely. I don't have the patience for it, my man. It sounds like a fun game, maybe at a later stage in my life, but I'm like jacked on like level nine all the time, like walking around, swinging a club, having a nice leisurely breeze run through your hair. It sounds nice, but I couldn't do it. All right. But anyways, I have played golf. I, I think I, maybe I could get into it at some stage in my life. But anyways, regardless, whenever you come out to Scottsdale, my friend, hopefully you enjoy it and have yourself a great round. And I'm thinking about doing some more. Well, we'll leave that for another day. But shout out to Wings. Thank you for the dono, my man. And we're grateful. It, we can go, we can go uh, lift some weights, though, if you want to get into that. We got that going. Tahoe Blaze says, how can the judge stay on the case due to the lack of separation required by the law? Well, he's, he's just relying on an ethical opinion that he says gives him permission to do that. And he says it's not. The law doesn't apply to him, right? That the daughter doesn't have essentially a qualified conflict that applies. So that's all. That's all. What's up, Tahoe Blaze? We got Knox is here, defense attorney in Texas, says happy anniversary to the Rubos. 32 years is incredible. This old guy for 32 years for the Rubos with a big fat dono. Hey, <laughs> thank you, this old guy. 32 for 32 years. That's super fun. Thank you for that, for the Rubos. I guess I'll order some more salt. I'll pay it forward. What's up? We got Knox is here. Thank you for that one. And Knox says happy Wednesday, all. Very long, horrible court day again. Sorry to hear that, Knox. There really is something trickling down to local courts. The anger and rudeness are off the charts. So, yeah, maybe the prosecutors are all sleeping with each other now. 
Knox. Maybe they're all indicting each other and they all have like inner office relationships and, you know, oh, you know, someone's sleeping with that special counsel, that special counsel worked up to the bureau chief. It's just like madness in there. And they're all like, we're just going to prosecute insurrectionists all the time because we're allowed to do that. I'm sorry to hear that, Knox. It's really a, a dis, dis satisfying thing to think about. And um, hopefully there's a change soon because it's our justice system. It's a very special thing. You know, having justice in a nation is a special thing. It's not something to scoff at. Like we take it for granted currently, but it's not always going to be there. And then we're going to have to live in a much more unjust society and people are going to have a real, real rude awakening. And we're all going to be sitting here saying, we told you so 10 years ago, we told you so bad poets here. The company claimed like 560 million in returns on the website and an all time hit list of dirty Dems. Wow. What company is that? Bad poet says Laura Mercon. Oh, how? Oh, I see. Yeah. Five. So, so authentic campaigns is making that much money. Wild times. And my friends, thank you so much for sending those in. Those came over from our friends on rumble on YouTube, on locals, super grateful for all of those that have come in. Let's see if X was working at all. I know we were having some technical difficulties over there. So let's see if it is functional or not. We got a couple comments over here. Let's see who's in the house. Oh yeah, that says not available. Hey, what's up, Michelle? Thank you for that, Michelle. Love what you do. Something's up with the link. Feline says, good show, Rob. Took me from utter rage at the bias of the jury to the hilarity at George Conway's Farrah Fawcett hairdo. Yeah, he's, I don't know what he's going through. Hopefully his friends are talking to him. Say, hey man, put some hair, hair gel back into it, okay? She's not, gonna, she's not coming back. She, we gotta move on, man. Find a nice liberal girl. I started a seven day poll on who people would vote for 2024, Biden or Trump. Within the few, for, within the few, few hours, the poll looked like this, and then it flipped. And then it turned around like this about an hour ago. Weird. So I wonder if those were all bots. You just kind of got botted. Somebody just identified it as bot. Hey, what's up, Danny Williams? We got says in Georgia here, can't watch it on X. And oh, that's too bad. Some people, it looks like we're able to watch it, but then others actually no. a lot of people can't watch. Here's one crypto crypto nerd watching from Texas. No video access in Prescott, Arizona. Oh man, what's going on? That's weird. Not available in your location. All right. It's got to be an Elon problem. I'm guessing YouTube's working fine. Weird. The tubes, the feds were in the tubes. Fred Petamonte said no one's above the law. Unlike Alejandro Mayorkas. Yeah, he, he's clearly above the law. He gets impeached, but no Senate trial. Weird how that works. Another one. What, tubes are clogged. Best way for Dems to disqualify Trump would be to admit that he won 2022 and can't run again. <laughs> I see what you're saying. Rhonda says, reading the jury pool reminds me of that old show called The Dating Game, how the game show host could, would introduce the potential dates. Only this jury pool show has clowns in it, but I'm from Rhonda. What's up, Azok? Yeah, we had some technical difficulties on X, but my friends, hopefully you found us elsewhere. You can follow us on X and connect with other watchers out there in the wild on X when the platform's working at Rob Govea. ESQ.com. No, Rob Govea, ESQ on X, not .com. Leave the .com off. That's the website. But my friends, that is it for us on the day. We are going over to watching the watchers.locals.com for our members only after party where we're going to hang out and debrief a little bit. We'd love to see you there. We do streams in the morning five days a week plus Saturdays. So come check it out. We talk about other things we can't get to here, like the election and Joe Biden's incompetence and many other things. We'd love to have you join us watching the watchers.locals.com, robertgovea.com, linked in the description for PDFs, show notes, calendar. Show's gonna be one hour later tomorrow and Friday here. So if you wanna add that calendar to your phone so you can be apprised of that, you'll find it over there. And of course, watcherlodge.com. Come sign up for Sovereignty Saturdays. And we should have a good one this Saturday because I've got two full days of an event Thursday and Friday that we'll do a little bit of debriefing on 
uh, in the self-development category on Saturday, Genius Network event. So come check it out, my friends. Any one of those links, we'd love to see you. We want to continue our connection and our relationship elsewhere. So come join us. We want to thank the mods and the meme smiths before we wrap it up and head on over to locals for the day. Big shout outs and thank yous to our friend, Donut Mind Me in the house, Economy Pilot, Dog Digger, our friend Janek, Zach Nichols, Ronnie Cole, Playing Hooky, Just Cause, and of course, K Bean, always modding the fort down for us, keeping things nice and orderly, along with our meme smith, Sleepy Dog Lee, Nathan, N810, and Gigum Gigum, beautifying the place as well. That, my friends, is it for us on the day. Tomorrow, we're going to be back day three, jury selection in tow. And I hope that you come back here and join us because we're going to be back here tomorrow. It's going to be a Thursday. And we're going to need to see you right back here so that together, with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. See you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.